Good evening, folks. Glad to see uh, everyone here. You should stay inside. It's going to snow, so we're all better off here. Maybe it'll all stay in the suburbs. Uh, I'm Al Shreesheim. I am president of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. I'm former director of Argonne National Laboratory. And uh, tonight, one of our continuing series of programs on science and technology <clears throat> and the critical relationship between science, technology, society, critical issues that affect us all, on this one on nanotechnology. Before uh, I introduce our speakers. I want to encourage you at the end of the meeting to fill out these audience satisfaction cards. It tells us uh, a lot about the type of programs that uh, you like to see here and uh, whether you think we're doing a good job and uh, whether or not these uh, events are events that are of general interest. You see we have a spectrum, the audience, students, science cognizanti, non-science cognizanti, so we try and, and uh, capture a uh, large group. Those of you who are not members, I encourage you to become members. We are a membership organization. And with that, <clears throat> I'm really pleased that we have two really outstanding uh, practitioners of the science and technology of uh, nanotechnology. Mark Ratner is the Dumas professor, university professor and co-director of the Institute for Sustainability and energy at Northwestern University. Mark is a material chemist, focuses work, his work focuses on the interplay of molecular structure and molecular properties. I uh, will uh, only comment on some uh, romance, if you will, particularly interested in international collaborations, Denmark, Israel, the Netherlands. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Sciences, and the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences. So a well-recognized and regarded international scientist. Milan Merksic, who uh, will be our second speaker, is a professor in the departments of biomedical engineering, chemistry, cell and molecular biology at Northwestern University. He uh, is an escapee from the University of Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, very well uh, respected uh, in, in the world in which he inhabits. He's considered a world leader in the realm of engineering. The interface between cells and surfaces moves with ease between chemistry, biology, biophysics, nanotechnology, material science, cell biology, and he focuses on how cell surfaces are engineered. So a scientist and engineer, and also the uh, founder, stimulator and founder of at least one company that I know of. I don't know how many. So um, many honors, Camille and Henry Dreyfus, new faculty award, the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, American Chemical Society, Arthur C. Cope, Arthur Clay Cope, uh, Scholar Award, and also named by Technology 
review as a top 100 young innovator. So I think that uh, we are, I know, I don't think, I know that we're particularly fortunate in this world of uh, the infinitely small. Those of you who may have heard of Richard Feynman, I remember said there's, I think, plenty of room at the bottom is the way he phrased it. So with that, uh, Mark, <clears throat> it's a real honor to be introduced by Alan Shreesheim, um, somebody that I've respected, actually venerated for quite a long time, and being involved in any adventure that he's along on is something that is very valuable. Um, the picture indicates the fact that one thing Alan didn't say is that I'm a diehard Cubs fan. And that's a, you know, that's sometimes a painful thing to be, but nevertheless, nevertheless, we, we go forward. Um, that's the wonderful city that we're privileged to live in. Nano, that's the topic for tonight. Milan will talk about some very important biological aspects. I'm gonna talk about some other things. Um, I looked at this and I thought, you know, I'll talk about nanotechnology, small is beautiful and I'll thank all those people and I'll thank them. And then I noticed the orange color. And it turns out that apparently the people who determine the fashion world get together in Paris once a year and determine the color. And this year's color is? Orange. Orange, yes. So you guys were ahead of things. Alan, did you know that? No. Absolutely true. <laughs> Absolutely true. So, so clearly this is a forward-looking organization and, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, Normally, I talk about Nano 101, but since this is Chicago, it's Nano 201. We're going to go on an extended tour, but it's going to be a fast one. Okay, so the first few pictures have to give you some idea of what Nano is. Nano means dwarf in Greek, and a Nano anything is a billionth of anything. So, you know, a Nano National Vet is for a lot of money. A nano inch is a billionth of an inch, a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, and that refers to a length scale. And nanotechnology is considered as everything between one and 100 nanometers, but that means nothing to anybody. Billion doesn't mean anything. We're gonna start here with the southwestern United, southeastern United States. And we're gonna expand that little thing in the middle by 10. And then we're gonna do it again, and we're gonna do it again, and we're gonna do it again, and we're gonna do it again. If you're unhappy with kilometers, that's about 600 miles, yeah, it's about 600 miles. Okay, so we're gonna go up there. Now we've gone from 600 miles to 60 miles, and we're in Northwest Florida. Now we're gonna do it again. So we've gone down by 100. Now we're in Tallahassee, which is the capital of Florida. There's some lakes, so we'll go down by another one. All right, we've now gone down by 1,000. So we're 1,000 times smaller. And we see that this is the National Magnet Laboratory where the world's strongest magnets are. And we'll do it again. I'll get us to 100 meters, that's roughly 100 yards, and that is lake and oak trees. And we'll go down again. Now we've gone down so far, I think, by a factor of 100,000. So we're really getting small very fast. Okay. And now we're in the leaves of this oak tree, right? Oak tree top. We'll do it again. We go from the oak tree top to the oak tree leaves, and they don't look like healthy oak tree leaves from Chicago to me, but they live in Florida. So, but, but you know, those are the leaves. So now we're gonna look down. We'll do it again. And this is actual size, right? So this is projected without magnification or, or you know, smallification or whatever. Um, so that's roughly the size. And now we're gonna take this one in the middle. We're at 100 millimeters, which is a 10th of a centimeter, which is about a 20th of an inch. All right, we'll do it again. 10 millimeters. Now we see the central spine of the oak leaf. One millimeter. You can see this. If you can't see it you know, with, with your eye, you just get a cheap magnifying glass and look at a leaf. You would see this. You can see that the surface here is enlarged, and you can see the basic you know, kind of organizing vein down the middle and these small areas. And when we look at the small areas, what we see are many cells. Now, this number, 100 microns, a micron is a millionth of a meter. So think about it as a millionth of a yard. So this is 100 millionths of a yard or a thousandth of a yard. And you guys can actually see this, right? Because that's about the same size that this is. 
something that Milan knows a lot more about than I do. Um, but we're at human hair size. And now we're going to go down smaller. So now we're at a tenth of a human hair, and we see the individual cells. Many people actually can see these. My eyesight is not good enough to see these, but we're going to go down another 10, and then nobody can see them. Right, so now we've gone down by a factor of 100 million, and we are at one micron, which is a millionth of a meter. And this is the nucleus of a cell. And now we know inside the nucleus of a cell, and get to 100 nanometers. And this is the biggest range of the nanoscale. Now, you can't possibly see it. And you can't see it with a magnifying glass, and you can't see it with a microscope. There are ways in which you can see it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But these are called, this is called chromatin. That's the way DNA is actually organized within the cells of the body. And for the sort of 100 size scale in size, from 100 meters nanometers to 10 nanometers. This is the famous double helix of DNA. So you can see that double helix kind of curling around on itself. That's at 100 nanometers. And then we go down to one nanometer, which is the bottom of the nanoscale, and that is individual atoms and molecules. I'm a chemist. Chemists care about atoms and molecules. So this is, this is the regime in which I'm happy, right? So chemists were born doing nanoscale. They didn't know it at the time, but they were. And that's, in fact, still the case. So we went down by 100 billion to get here. Okay? But now let's look at this length scale from 100 to 1 nanometer. Big ones are not necessarily a friendly one. The flu virus, this very beautiful looking entity, is actually a flu virus. He's been magnified 320,000 times, so you can see him. And he's at the big end of the nanoscale. He's 100 nanometers across. We go down to a tenth of that, well, actually a half of that. We see a bacteriophage. This is something that helps protect us from beasts like that. That's smaller. Those are natural nanostructures. Let's make them artificial nanostructures. These artificial nanostructures are actually made at Northwestern by my colleague, Jed Merkin. And what's going on here is there's a great big dot of gold in the middle with little dots of gold around the outside. They're held together by molecules that you can't see. But you know that, that looks like a sort of child's painting. And the big ones are at 50 nanometers, and the little ones are at about 13 nanometers. Smaller than that is the world's smallest abacus. So this was made at IBM, and for a while you could get on the web and actually do calculations on the abacus. You could move the little beads back and forth, just like your real abacus. Now this abacus is really little. It's been multiplied by 15 million times, and the little beads are called carbon-60. They look like a soccer ball but they're made out of carbon atoms, and they're really little. OK, so now here's the question. Everybody's played with an abacus? When you play with an abacus, how do you move the beads? With your finger. Suppose the beads were this big. How would you move the beads? The answer to that question is why nanotechnology has really made a huge effect on modern life. The way you do it is to get a finger that's that small and that you can control. And that was invented, actually, a long time ago, in the, in the 1980s. And in fact, starting in the 1980s, this idea of nano began based on those instruments I'll talk about in a minute. And you know, I teach at a private university, which tuition is you know, like a dollar and a half a minute to be in lectures and things like that. That's really right. And so they come out with this because it's, it's a, you know, a way to gather money by telling alumni about what we do. And it says, small is big, the amazing world of nanotechnology. And to be fair, we were really lucky. And we built the first federally funded nanotechnology building in the country. And we got one of the first programs going. So the very first nanotechnology building at Northwestern is this nanotechnology building. And <laughs> the two people in front of it, you may recognize one of them, the other one is that guy, Chad Merkin, and he is one of the foremost nanotechnology scientists in the world, in fact. That was his first office, but we decided he was a little big for that office, so we moved him into a different office. This is the building that replaced that, and this is the, the it's called the Ryan Building, and it's where nano, nanoscience started at Northwestern. Actually, it's gone substantially beyond that building because this is a very exciting scientific field. Lots of people are interested. Professor Merksich, for example, who does some beautiful bio-nano stuff. It's actually not in that building, but in a nearby building. So even though it's small, it winds up taking a lot of space and costs a lot of money. Right. So it's little, big deal. There are smaller things. 
There are much smaller things. The nucleus of an atom is a thousand times smaller. And then the subparticles of the nucleus, hadrons and things like that, they're even smaller. So why is this special? It's special for three reasons. One, it's the design scale of nature. Remember, we said it was atoms and molecules. And it's what make us up hair and knee bones and wood and everything else that we live with based on atoms and molecules. It's also a form of self-assembly, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Self-assembly is what happens when you drive into a filling station and it's been raining and you see these wonderful rainbow patterns on the surface. That's a self-assembled monolayer. They're molecules that are greasy and they don't like being in water, so they float on the top. And then you get this wonderful refraction pattern and they look colored. So that's a self-assembling feature. And they are size dependent. Now that's an unusual thing, so let's, let's see if we can deal with that. First, this is how you move the abacus beads. You move the abacus beads with these things. They are called tips, because they're tips, right? They look like tips. But the, the end of that tip, the, the sort of radius out there, is about the size of those beads that you saw before. So just like your fingers can move the beads on a real abacus, these guys can move the beads on that little nano abacus. And this was invented at IBM um, in 1983, IBM in Zurich. And these guys, won, you know, they won Nobel Prizes, but they changed science. They changed science by inventing a new tool. Why is this an interesting tool? It's just a little pen, right? But it is a little pen. So you can use it to push things around like you can with a real pen. And you can use it to draw as you can with a real pen. And you can use it to estimate sizes and structures. So the drawing part is something that Chad picked up on. So <clears throat> that's a pen. And the way it works, there's ink in here, and the ink comes down there, and it goes onto the paper, and you draw a line, and you can read it. And if you have good penmanship, you make nice L's, and if you have bad penmanship, you make bad L's, but you can draw any line you want. So just as you can draw any line you want with that, well, you can draw any line you want with one of those tips that I talked about, too. All you have to do is get the right ink on it. And the ink can be any molecule at all. And so this technique really copies from this, except there it's a millimeter, and here it's 10 nanometers. So you're drawing the smallest lines you could possibly draw. If you wrote a love note in this, it wouldn't do any good, because the person wouldn't be able to read it. Right? But you can read it under certain conditions, and sometimes it's really useful. So this is a letter. Actually, it's not a letter. It's a quotation from Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was a very famous scientist who predicted the whole nano thing, some essays that he wrote in 1959, called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, actually. And this was a fundraising speech to the Caltech alumni. And what he said was, as soon as I mention this, people tell me about miniaturization and how far it has progressed today. They tell me about electric motors that are the size of the nail on your finger. And there's a device on the market by which you can write the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. And then he says, but that's nothing. It is a staggeringly small world that is below. In the year 2000, when they look back, they will wonder why it was not until 1960 that anybody seriously began to think about this. So Feynman is suggesting that you make things on these tiny little length scales. Now, he didn't know about that finger, that tip, that was invented 21 years after this talk. But this is sort of the intellectual parent of everything that I'm talking about. So why would you care about writing in such small letters. Well, one reason you would care is we all have internet accounts and we all occasionally get some spam that tells us that they'll sell us some sort of drug for about one-tenth of what it costs at the local pharmacy, right? And we've all been tempted to do this. Well, if you're a drug manufacturer, you're concerned about this, not only because of the profit motive, but because maybe somebody's taking your name and making something that you didn't make and maybe that's something you didn't make is toxic. And maybe that's something that you didn't make and is toxic. People will buy on the web and take, and then they'll sue you because they'll think it's yours. So security is really very important. The security of communications, the security of product realization. And so one of the things that these people are interested in is using that dip pen nanolithography process that I talked about to put little codes on every single pill. And you wouldn't be able to but if you knew exactly where it was written and how it was written, you would be able to read it. OK. Now, I said that at the nanoscale, properties become size dependent. Now, the best example is at all 
are the examples from medieval times. This is a picture of Saint Chapelle. No, it isn't. <laughs> these are pictures of silver particles. And these are real silver particles Merkin made in the lab. And that one's silver, and that one's silver, and that one's silver, and that one's silver, and none of them really look silver except maybe that one, right? But they're all silver. It's just that they're silver of different sizes. Now, why the different size silvers have different colors? Think about bells. A great big bell makes a deep sound, right? And a little small bell makes a high-pitched sound. That's because the bell is small. And so the wave of sound energy can only make it as big as that. And so that's a very high-pitched sound. And if you make a big bell, you get a really low-pitched sound because the bell is larger. And so the wavelength of the sound is longer, and therefore you get a deeper sound. Now, the same thing is true here, only it's light waves instead of sound waves. And that's why these colors are different. These are both gold, right? That's a sphere of gold that's 50 nanometers across, and that's a sphere of gold that's 50, 50 nanometers across. That one's green, that one's yellow, neither one's gold. What was true in the Middle Ages was that they knew all about this. So they were doing nanoscience back in the 11th century. This is Saint-Chapelle. And many of these colors, not all, but many of these colors are gold. Did they know that they were doing nanotechnology? No, they didn't know they were doing nanotechnology. What they knew was that somebody had told them that if you take this bit of gold and you put it between two pieces of leather and you add the appropriate stuff that came from the cow that was out in the field and you beat up on it for long enough, you would get a very, very thin material that's that color. So they were doing all the things that you do now to make nanoparticles. They just didn't know they were, but they're very beautiful. This is the most beautiful application of nanoparticles that I can think of. Now, is there another application? Well, this is from Chad's work also. This is the beginning of, of a discussion of BioNano that, that Professor Merksich will take much farther. But suppose that it's after 9-11 and you are a um, post office employee in New Jersey and there's a, a letter, and it's got white dust in it, and you're worried that the white dust might be anthrax. Okay, now if you remember, those of you who are old enough to remember, we were all concerned about this, and it was on the news all the time. They're analyzing this stuff. It took them three days to analyze it, and they got it wrong, so they did it again. Well, if it were really a terrorist attack, you wouldn't want three days, you'd want three hours. So how would you identify anthrax? Well, anthrax has unique DNA. So you would take the white powder, and you'd break off the DNA, you'd break the DNA up into little pieces, and then you would add it to a solution with gold particles. And remember, gold particles, when they change sizes, they change colors. All right, so this gold particle is, is labeled with one end of the DNA that's the bad guy, and this one is labeled with another end of the DNA that's the bad guy. And remember, DNA takes a double helix, so the blue is going to join the blue, and the green, red is going to join the red, and what's going to happen is they're going to pull the particles together. And as the particles come together, its color changes from blue to red. Now, I have this extremely sophisticated PowerPoint, which will show you what happens here. Yeah, I think. Yes, it is. OK. So now you can see that the red is binding to the red, and the blue is binding to the blue. And as that happens, it brings those particles together. But it only happens if that red strand there is exactly conjugate, the partner, of that red strand there, and that blue guy is the conjugate of that blue guy. So you can make these particles to recognize various things. You could make them recognize that it's anthrax, or the flu, or anything else that you know, was propagated by DNA. So this is what you get, and the, the analysis is actually done, originally nated by, by Bob Letzinger, was one of my older colleagues, and Chad Merkin, and Chad's student, Bobby Musich, about 20 years ago. And this is actually found in hospitals around the world now. There's a, there was a company that was started to manufacture this stuff because it's really very, very useful, not only for anthrax, but for anything else. So when you go into the doctor's office and you know, they collect saliva or a blood sample and they send it off to the lab, this is going to be in the lab. OK. Yeah, let me spend a little bit of time on regenerative medicine. We are in the medical school at Northwestern. And um, one of the, the, the sort of new areas of medicine is regenerative medicine, meaning something's wrong with you. You have a bad back, maybe, 
And maybe your bad back comes about because you've been around for a while and uh, you've been using your back and the discs are sort of coming together. You'd really like to be able to regenerate. Suppose you've been injured in a bad accident. Well, what Sam Stoop and his group did back 10 years ago now was to think about molecules that looked like this. That's a greasy end of the molecule. And that guy who's red, white, and blue is a particular structure that will bind to a particular protein. So if you make this log, right, the outside of it has all these protein targets, which are called epitopes, and which say to a particular enzyme, bind here. So what this thing is, it's like a piece of glue. You swallow it, goes around the body, and whenever it encounters its target, the guys who will bind to this, they bind to it. It looks like this. It's a long log-like, or if you like, spaghetti-like entity. But it's a spaghetti-like entity that's labeled on the outside such that it will attract growth hormone in this particular case. Now, I'm not professionally employed in this building, and so I'll probably get the words wrong, but here's what happened. This work was done by Sam in collaboration with a number of doctors at Northwestern Medical School, and in particular, Jack Kessler, who's the head of neurology. All right, so suppose that you have a spinal cord injury. Okay? And now, there, there's some words on here that should get your attention. Right? So what happens is, suppose you're skiing and, and you bang into a tree. Okay? And, and there's a, a serious sort of incursion into, into your spinal column. What happens is the crush applies the force to the inner core of the cord. This causes necrosis. All these words sound frightening to me. Necrotic cells, they release radicals, calcium, and excess transmitters, causing excitotoxicity. Okay, that toxicity and necrosis. And then apoptosis, that means cell death. So things die. And the reason they do is that the body is protecting itself. But, and there's eventually an immune response. But what has happened here is that you've built a permanent lesion. And, you know, if this happens to a mouse, and then you look at what has happened to the mouse, this is the fiber tract coming from the brain. It's supposed to go over here to tell the feet what to do, but it's been broken, right? And there's a scar, and there are cysts, and the whole area here is disconnected. It's like a, an electric wire that you've cut. And what, what Sam wants to do Sam and Jack and their colleagues want to do, is to build a nano bridge across here that will cause it to regenerate itself. Okay, so again, you now make this log, you inject it right into the mouse, right where that injury is, and then you wait to see what happens. This is what happens when it's in the body, it forms a gel. It's not just that there's one log or two, but there are a whole bunch of logs together. And on each surface, there's this binding center that says bind here. Okay, so here's the cartoon of what happens. You inject into the mouse. The material that you inject moves around. It comes right here. It interacts with the ions. It assembles. It self-assembles. It builds the bridge across the lesion, or at least it's supposed to. So this is some of the very earliest data. And if you're going to do this, you don't want to work on people. You want to work on, on rodents because, well, because. So this is the very, very first data. Um, days after the injury, this BBB score has to do with the mouse, whether the mouse can move its feet or not. And you can see that the control does this, and the one with the gel injected does that. This was early, early data. They've done much more with it now. But it's a form of regenerative medicine. This mouse is going to be brought back. As Jack says, if you're a mouse with Parkinson's, I can do a lot for you. OK. Let me spend 30 seconds on a different this is a cartoon. It's not science. It's a cartoon of science. It's a cartoon of one of the most amazing processes that I know of, which is photosynthesis. Almost all the energy on Earth came from photosynthesis, right? Because photosynthesis gave us the primitive plants, and the animals that ate the primitive plants were the primitive animals. And those two forms of life, when they died, and were subjected to pressure of a long time, over a long period of time, in the Earth they made coal and they made oil. So most of our fuel actually comes from photosynthesis. And today, you know, you burn a log in your fireplace, 
That energy came from photosynthesis. Photosynthesis has four nanostructures, one, two, three, four, one of which is more amazing than the next. They're all arranged in a membrane. And what they do is to take light from the sun and turn it into energy and chemical energy. And we'd like to be able to do this. We'd like to be able to do artificial photosynthesis. But we'd also like to be able to capture energy from the sun and turn it into electricity. Why? Well, we are in an age where we care about energy and sustainability. This is worldwide energy use. It's a picture from NASA. Um, it's the whole world. It never really could be done, right? Because the sun's always shining on part of the world. But, but it's a cartoon that shows where light is being used. Light is being, energy is being used in this part of the United States. God knows in Chicago, which is right there. West Coast, a little bit up in Alaska. Big cities in South America. All of, of Europe, certainly in Japan. Parts of Australia, parts of South Africa. Then there are all these blue areas, right? Lots of blue areas where energy isn't being used very much. When they start using energy the way we use energy, the world's going to require a great deal more energy. And where's it going to come from? Well, it would be nice if we could invent new forms of energy. Instead of burning fossil fuels, or in addition to burning fossil fuels, suppose we could do something else. This is a cartoon. The cartoon was drawn by one of my colleagues, Naomi Kwasluski, who runs a center on solar energy. And it's a cartoon of many, many nanostructures. There's an aluminum nanostructure. There are organic nanostructures. There's an Indian nanostructure. There's a plastic foil. Point is, sunlight comes in, and electricity comes out. And so I don't want to give a whole discussion on, on solar energy and not a whole discussion on the use of nano to solve the energy problem. But in my view, it's one of the ways that we will solve the energy problem. Know what that is? What is it? It's the first transistor. Yeah, it's the first transistor. This was designed at Bell Labs in the 1940s. It doesn't look terribly impressive. I'm impressed that you knew that it was a transistor, the transistor. It was designed by three people. Now, this was the 1940s when scientists got dressed up to go to work. It was also in the 1940s when almost all scientists looked the same. They were white males. Um, Three truly brilliant people. This guy in particular was a spectacularly brilliant guy. But it was, a, it was a team effort. It was the three of them from different backgrounds, physics and engineering, getting together to try to develop something that they thought the society needed. Actually, they thought their bosses needed, but the society needed. And that's the recipe, right? The recipe is collaborative, fundamental science and engineering that trains and inspires young scientists. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This young scientist, her name is Jill Millstone. She's an assistant professor of chemistry at the University of Pittsburgh. And she is very happy because in that bottle, that blue stuff is silver. They're silver triangles. And she was the first person ever to make silver triangles. So that kind of enthusiasm is the kind of enthusiasm that I think is going to help us solve these problems using nanoscience. There's a lot of hype. Niels Bohr was a great scientist. This is one of the things he was supposed to have said. But he smoked a pipe, and he mumbled, and he spoke Danish, and so he might have said anything. <laughs> um, this comes from an appropriately named magazine, which is up there, um, back 10 years ago. And they said, you know, nanotech is what follows the computer, the automobile, the railroad, and textiles. Maybe there are similarities. And it will be interesting to see if this prediction is right. Predicting the future is very difficult. Um, I have four quotes for you. Director of the United States Patent Office, 1929, said basically, you might as well shut the thing down because everything that needs to be invented has already been invented. That was quite a long time ago. Um, Thomas J. Watson, Sr., founder, really, of IBM. Five computers should be enough for society. There are more than five computers in this room right now, but <laughs> IBM didn't listen to him. Um, yeah, this one is not only wrong in fact, it's even wrong grammatically. It would be nice to believe that that's true, but, but it isn't. And finally, for the geeks among us, okay, so people have not predicted the future terribly well, but these are some targets for nanoscience. These are some things that I think nanoscience is capable of doing. The ones in black are already done. You can get a stainless tie that's coated with fluorine. You can get non-freezing windshields, which is good. You can get greaseless suntan lotion. 
But these are big ones. Truly efficient solar radiation capture. That's a biggie. Because remember, there's 100 times more sun energy coming on Chicago than Chicago uses. We just don't know how to use it yet. We will. And I think it's going to be nano. All these things, the five-minute health swab test, human repair, we've talked about that, optical computers, all of these things are pretty major efforts in the society, and I think all of them can profit from nano. Okay, and then there are issues beyond technology. I don't want to talk about those because it's late. Young man on a pond in Massachusetts, age 25, right after the Civil War. Last line of Walden is that line. I think where we are in nanoscience, it's about 30 years old, because it followed from an invention that came about in about 1982. It has already changed many, many things about science. It has a lot more to change. That's the place we live, and if we're going to live on that place, we're going to have to preserve it and conserve it for our children and grandchildren and generations after them. And I think nanoscience is a way to do it. Um, so I will stop. Milan will talk, and then if it hasn't snowed too badly, we'll have some questions. Okay, thanks, Mark. Thanks, uh, Alan, for the introductions and. Uh, helping put this together. And uh, you know, it's easy to follow Mark because he's explained everything. So even if I mumble through it, you understand it. But certainly hard to follow that show. So let me give it a start. And I also recognize from being in the audience at times that the best evenings are when the receptions are longer and the talks are shorter. So <laughs> I'll try to get through this without, uh, I've not included too much material. Uh, what I wanted to do, I suppose, initially is show you my slides and uh, those should be here. Perfect. OK. So I like to think a lot about how materials and biology interface and how you can engineer materials to be uh, useful in life sciences applications. And you know, early on, years ago, we started to recognize that the way engineers think about materials technology, so you know, computer chips, mechanical devices, accelerometers that deploy your airbags, the kinds of rules and blueprints and designs that we use to think about assembling those are very different than the ways we think about building life science technologies, whether it's uh, tissue, uh, 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 drugs, and other therapeutics. And uh, what I want to kind of suggest tonight, or get in the start of an argument tonight, is that it, when we design computer chips and mechanical devices, we're using principles that are well known to us. They really come from the macroscopic world, Newtonian physics, and we know how to scale those down. But when we go to the life sciences, biology didn't evolve based on uh, macroscopic interactions, but really based on the interactions of nanoscale components and building blocks, and it requires a different sort of thinking. And I'm going to suggest that we're not very good at it yet, but the breakthroughs in nanoscience, the ability to create and prepare nanoscaled matter is really putting us in a position to understand how biology works, which will put us in a position to better intervene, treat disease, exploit biological systems, et cetera. So that's the kind of theme of what I want to cover. And let me kind of emphasize that point a little bit by saying that you can find complex systems in the in the human world, whether they're computer chips that have a billion transistors built into them, uh, an aircraft carrier, or a Dreamliner. These are machines that are built out of thousands of parts. But when they're built, we actually have blueprints or designs that tell us basically everything about them, how to assemble them. If we need to go in and fix something, these blueprints tell us what parts need to be replaced or exchanged. Uh, if we want to predict failures, we kind of know what the reliability of the different parts are and what happens if you disable one or another. And even if you need to repurpose the machine and give it more function, we know how to load new software on. I mean, that's a bad example because usually computers work great until the next version of software comes out. Then you have to buy a new computer. But you understand the point. That's predicted by the people writing the software and selling the machines. So we actually have a predictive 
kind of technology in the human engineered world. And I would argue that the same isn't true in biology despite the successes that we have in medicine and treatment. So, you know, the idea is that, you know, we sequenced the human genome a dozen years ago. Now you can sequence it for a few thousand dollars. So it's kind of remarkable that any one of us can get our genome basically sequenced. Uh, and we thought that would be the answer. That would give us the information we needed to be smart about developing drugs, treating disease, predicting future uh, disease onset. But drug development today is still a trial and error uh, activity. You know, we do screening. We take 500,000 small molecules and we test them one by one to find a small molecule that looks like it works in a lab experiment. And then we go into an animal some of those might work. We go into humans and some completely fail and we don't understand why. So drug discovery is still important, but don't uh, let that suggest that it's something that we're good at in the sense that it's rational. There's nothing rational about the way we come up with a small molecule therapeutic. We're not very good at diagnosing disease. I mean, there are certainly real examples where Advances in medical imaging and early cancer detection have made a world of difference in, in treatment. But in general, you know the story. You go to the doctor, this hurts. They try one thing, you go back. Well, it wasn't that. It's actually this we need to treat you for. And after five or six times, they get it right. And that's really a reflection that we're not very good at, uh, again, diagnosis. Biomarkers are those uh, proteins we test for. So. If one wants to look for prostate cancer, there's a PSA test, a prostate-specific antigen, and that was a breakthrough some years ago. There's only about one or two biomarkers approved by the FDA per year, even though there's a need for hundreds of them. So clearly, we're not very good at identifying and proving out biomarker uh, effectiveness. And then even the ones that are approved after they're on the market, there are real questions raised. I mean, with PSA, and this is true with a lot of markers, some of us just naturally have higher levels of that marker than others. And it's not whether your level is high or low that uh, puts you at risk for disease, it's whether the level is increasing over time. So what in, we're recognizing now with biomarkers is you should get tested every year or two just to establish your normal baseline so that when it starts to pick up, we know that that's a better indicator that uh, disease is uh, progressing. Okay, so these are things we didn't recognize a dozen years ago well. And then predicting failures. You know, we're built out of genes that code for proteins that are the players, and I'll say more about those. But if uh, we delete a protein, if a mutation inactivates a protein, uh, we can figure out through a lot of work why that protein is leading to a disease, but we can't predict in advance what the cause, what the effect would be for knocking out a protein. The way we do it now is we take a mouse, genetically engineer it, we make a knockout mouse and remove a gene and see what the effect is. So this mouse actually is interesting because uh, he was engineered with human growth factor. So genetically, human growth factor was put into that mouse's genetics and uh, that mouse grew a little bit bigger than his brother. And so that's still how we determine or try to get an understanding of what a failure uh, would uh, be caused by. So that's uh, the argument that there's something different about how we design materials and human technologies versus, versus biotechnologies. And, you know, we used to always say that's because biology is really complicated. The cell, the building block of tissues and of life is just complicated. But, you know, with time we better understand it and I would make an argument that it's not that complicated. A cell is not small or big in the sense that it's the size of human hair, 50 microns or so. We know that a cell carries a copy of DNA that's three billion bases. That used to be a big number, but we all have three gigabytes memory on our computers now, so you could carry around your genetic sequence on your machine. It's not a huge number. Uh, that DNA codes for the expression or the production of about 100,000 proteins. Proteins are the machines in the cell that carry out the functions. 
in groups of proteins working together, let us flex our muscle, have a thought, be conscious, those kinds of things. So 100,000 is not a big number. There are a thousand different small molecules, glucose, sugars, ATP, the energy source in life, and then uh, some water, some salt, and uh, lipids that kind of hold it all together. So it's not, you know, that's not more parts that an aircraft carrier has. But there's something different about it. I want to show you a little movie that's uh, uh, produced by a team at Harvard that tries to come up with animations of biological systems. And it will give you a look inside the cell and a kind of an appreciation of what makes a cell, a living system, different than a biological computer. So, So this is an animation, but it's really quite realistic. Uh, this is inside the cell. The resolution's not great, I'm sorry. Uh, but the cell membrane kind of anchors all sorts of structures. And these are individual proteins. Uh, their sizes are 10 to 50 nanometers. And the cell has a lot of structure in it. These cables that run through it and are used to organize where proteins are and where they meet each other to kind of hand off information. But they're dynamic, so this structure is assembling in space and in time when it's needed. And, uh, and then when it's not needed, the cell knows how to bind something to it so that it disassembles and falls apart. And so the cell has this kind of dynamic rewiring. It's got parts, but unlike the machine, the car engine, they're not put together to stay in place, but they are kind of interchanged over time. This is cool because it's a flexible motor protein. A protein that uses ATP to walk along those tracks and carry cargo from one part of the cell to another. And uh, what you're looking at here are uh, the nucleus, which is where DNA is expressed, and it shoots the messenger RNA out of the nucleus, where it can then be bound by these machines that are actually All right, so very different. I mean, when you look at a biological system, you can kind of see it's not how we think about building complex systems. These things are in water, parts diffuse around, they come together, they disengage, and you kind of create the active structures where you need them, when you need them. And one interesting facet of that is that these systems can uh, rewire themselves for different functions. So I'll say a little bit more about that. But as you think about this more, you know, how are living devices different from the devices that we, we make in the lab? And uh, here I would kind of compare the brain, which is a computer, to a uh, computer chip, to a laptop. And you know, one thing is that biological computers are robust. They fail gracefully. I mean, a computer, if a transistor goes, that whole thing freezes. You know, you're typing away and all of a sudden it goes into some mode where you can't communicate with it. There are a million ways you can kill a computer. But we know that we fail gracefully. You know, I'm in California to do something. I've got to take the red eye back so I can lecture in the morning to undergrads. And I show up, I take a shower so they don't know I was on the red eye all night. I start lecturing. 90% of what I say is just fine. Uh, makes sense, they buy it, 10% is absolutely wrong. I'm failing gracefully. I didn't shut off, I'm just getting some of it wrong. It doesn't take long to know you did that because 50 emails hit you an hour after lecture asking questions about something you said. These are smart students and if they don't, if the thing isn't consistent, they pick up on it. So tolerates imperfect, imperfective components. This is actually a deep uh, 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 value, I think, in a chip, if you've got a 700 million transistors, one of those goes out, 
and that system is fragile. Chip stops doing something. Our brain is built out of a trillion neurons. Those are parts. You can knock out any few percent of those and your brain can still do most of the things it has to do. So there's this robustness to it and this tolerance of, of, of defects that if we knew how to engineer in computer chips would make a world of difference, but we don't understand those design rules. Adaptable, uh, we certainly can learn to solve new problems. There was nothing in evolution that required us to do differential calculus, uh, but we had a brain structure that put us in a position to learn how to do advanced math. Computers generally are designed to do a function and not more. And then this is kind of neat, good at hard problems. We think computers are good at you know, solving hard problems. What's 27 factorial? We can be here all night and I can't work it out for you. But my phone can tell you in about a second what it is. Yet, we can do problems that computers can't. Uh, pattern recognition. If I show you a picture and say, where's Waldo? You can all find him. My six-year-old can find Waldo. Uh, but a computer still has a really, really hard job at that kind of problem, taking a complex landscape and picking something out. Uh, guessing the next step. I mean, this little video, I grew up watching this stuff, so you'll forgive me. In former but, years, we traveled uh, incognito, then you know, by freight. <laughs> what's going to happen Now here? we just stomach. But of all, all right. the rides I've taken... All right, what happens next? <laughs> right? All right. So that's the point, that like you can guess the next step, oh, right? Oh. You can take an incomplete set of data you and infer what's here. missing and draw a conclusion. I did we not still have a... Okay, so the rest of the... You might have not seen that coming. The guy might have just walked out of the room or threw some cake back. But uh, biological computers are really good at taking incomplete data sets, filling in the gaps, making guesses, and coming with a conclusion, and machines human-made machines aren't very good at that sort of thing. In former years so, uh, let me just skip that, and uh, it's up there, but I'm not going to discuss it. I kind of use this both because it's interesting to compare biotechnology with microelectronics and technology because they're both huge industries, really sophisticated, but one has a quite empirical basis, biology, and one has a quite quantitative kind of design rule basis. And uh, that's been one difference between biology and, and uh, physics, right? You go into physics if you're good at math, you go into biology if you're not. That's kind of an old stereotype. And you might wonder, I tried to trace that stereotype back and I found some interesting quotes from, you know, a Renaissance man of science uh, a couple hundred years ago who observed that every attempt to employ mathematical methods in the study of biological questions must be considered profoundly irrational and contrary to the spirit of biology. There was a time when I agreed with that. I don't anymore. But he certainly didn't want to be misunderstood. So he went on and said, if mathematical analysis should ever hold a prominent place in biology, an aberration which is happily almost impossible, it would occasion a rapid and widespread degeneration of that science. <laughs> okay? But this is happening. So, you know, there's a real argument that biology in another generation is going to be an information science. It's not going to be an experimental science where the way you get ahead is doing an experiment well. It's going to make advances because you can see connections in how those systems are organized and how they work, which is much more of a physics-based, chemistry-based kind of insight. And it's going to be neat to see how this big enterprise deals with that uh, if that plays out. Okay. So that kind of brings me back to a, the nano here. And without a lot of justification, I'm going to argue that biology has the functional features it has, that I covered a couple of those, and operates the way it does because it's intrinsically a nanoscale system. That you saw that movie, those parts moving around. If those proteins moving around were molecules, one nanometer in size, or were more micron scale objects, 100 microns in size, you couldn't get the functionality out of the cell that we get. And we might discuss that during the questions if you like. But I would argue that it is the nanoscale structure, having building blocks that are 10 to 50 
nanometers in size that lets us get this remarkable dynamics in the cell, this ability to put structures together to have one function, reassemble those structures differently to give another function, and to be able to regulate that in space and in time to kind of give this system this rich functionality that we honestly still don't know how to engineer in a, in a materials system. So these, so that means for us to make more progress in understanding and controlling life science systems, we've got to get better at building matter at that length scale. And uh, Mark had showed you some of the exciting properties that matter has when you confine its scale to that nano regime. But one of the drivers of our discovery and our understanding those principles was the ability to make those structures and to characterize stru those structures, coming up with that little tip that could move around atoms and characterize them, coming up with methods, chemical, physical, biological, that let us build matter that's controlled at those length scales, gave us an opportunity to understand their properties and then start to engineer their properties. And that's the same in computer science. The ability to do photolithography and make transistors led to the miniaturization of transistors. And the refinement in photolithography, going from 10 microns to 3 microns to where we are now, which is basically 100 nanometers, lets you get more transistors on a chip and more functionality. So you can't underestimate the importance of learning how to build matter and control matter at those scales as a scientific uh, kind of vehicle and then uh, to apply it to technology. So this is a kind of sketch of different nanoscale structures. This is kind of cool. This is 20 years old, a DNA sequence that folds into a cube. When Ned Seaman did this at the time, people didn't understand it and they weren't excited by it. But now it's one of our early examples of how in the laboratory you could make a structure perfectly defined that was 20 nanometers in size. Uh, this smiley face, that's a strand of DNA that winds up on itself in a certain way that leaves some gaps and you can kind of program different structures, kind of neat. Uh, and that's characterized using one of those little tips that runs across it to see where the height is and where the gaps are. Uh, these are other kinds of structures that are more periodic. So DNA or proteins that will kind of self-assemble into a lattice, into a crystal that's got a structure that's defined locally, but you can't control globally. Uh, and so this is kind of the state of the art. And the question is, can you make matter that's as precisely defined as that example, but larger? Can we make mega molecules that might have sizes of 100 nanometers, but every atom is where you want it to be and you know the precise structure. And that kind of ability, I think again, would offer a new opportunity to advance the science and technology of small stuff. So uh, I wanna share with you in just five slides or so, an approach that we started working on a couple of years ago that I think offers one solution to that problem. And so these are cartoons of protein structures. These little blobs are kinds of those pieces you saw on that video. So each one of those might be three or five nanometers. That might be 20 nanometers. Uh, that might be 30 or 40 nanometers. And these are proteins. And the way we normally make proteins is we use genetic uh, engineering. We basically feed DNA to a bacteria the bacteria takes the DNA and from that instruction set makes a protein. But there are limits. You can only use natural amino acids because bacteria uh, only know how to use naturally occurring amino acids. And you can only make structures up to a certain size because then those ribosome machines start to make mistakes and you can't make bigger ones. So we were thinking about how to develop more chemical methods to make structures without those limitations. And if you could make those structures and they had different chemistries plugged into them, you could then modify them. So you might be able to attach nanoparticles to them or catalysts, uh, structures that would have interesting optical properties, structures that might be useful in energy to more efficiently collect sunlight, separate charge, 
and plug that into another energy medium. So uh, the way that we kind of looked at this is said, could we come up with proteins that would very selectively react with some organic molecule? And we would use genetic engineering and synthetic chemistry, and the details aren't critical here, uh, so that we could treat a protein with a small molecule and they would react and plug into each other in a very selective way and make a new bond, so we would join them. So the kind of neat thing in science is have you named your thing well? Because if you name it well, people remember it. So I kind of like the dock and lock, except uh, I got an email from somebody who was looking for the NRA, and they uh, <laughs> said, is this you know, the lock and dock and whatever? And I said, no, you got the wrong guy. So anyhow, this kind of strategy works pretty well. So if we take a protein and we make a little linker that's got the two sticky ends, the two ends that will find their pocket on the protein, we should be able to join these two guys. And in fact, that works really well. We can take these proteins, join them, and then in electron microscopy, we've actually labeled these with little nanoparticles to see them, but you see all these dimers that we've put together. These tetramers are actually just two different dimers that have stuck to each other, nonspecifically. So this gives us a way to piece these together. And you can kind of take that idea further and say if we can come up with more of these uh, modules, more of these Lego pieces that would let us snap things together, we might have more control in how we can build bigger structures. So a couple of students in the lab kind of developed other proteins that would selectively react with other organic molecules to link them. And then we could start to create proteins that had two halves, one protein on the left and one on the right. And if we create those, then we could start to couple those together. So we take one of those, uh, what we call fusion proteins, we treat it with a molecule that blocks one of the sides, and then treat it with a molecule that's got two linkers. So the purple linker finds its active site and binds it, and then we've got this hanging off, which can pick up a second protein, which can be charged with another ligand, pick up a third protein, and we can start to build these ropes of protein, and we can actually see these molecules getting bigger. If we do a kind of separation, this is the small one, the next biggest one, the next biggest one, they're getting bigger. And this is really nice synthesis because it happens in water at room temperature. It's efficient, it's fast, it's high yielding. So we can start to plug these structures together. And in fact, uh, for fun, my nine-year-old daughter came in and made some interesting structures. Uh, her reasons for doing it were different, but that's fine. She's in the lab. So then we can go bigger. I mean, if this stuff works well, I'm, I've slipped in here a third piece. So now I've got a green building block, a blue building block, and a yellow building block. For each of those, we have a kind of a tag that reacts with it. And here's a protein that's now, I think, 50 nanometers long, and that every atom is precisely defined in the structure. And it's a single kind of structure. So last couple slides that we can make branched structures. So if the linker I use to join those is trivalent, it has three pieces coming off a hub, then when I react this uh, protein with the linker, I've got three arms. And again, I can build structures that you can't make with biological methods. Proteins are linear molecules by definition. That's how they're made. But if we can get a synthetic method going, we can make structures that are different geometries. We can actually make structures that are circular. So by using the right building blocks, uh, we can then come in with a linker that joins this end to that end and circular, circularizes those proteins. So it's a remarkable building set. It's just six or seven building blocks, reagents, these proteins and these linkers that can be put together in any order that leads to building them up into giant structures. These structures are unprecedented. We've set the record several times now on the largest molecule that's been made in a kind of precisely defined version. So I won't tell you what we've done with those because we haven't done a lot with them yet. We've been spending our effort working on how to build them. 
And now we're at the stage where we're starting to apply them. So in the last slide here, I'll just give you a little bit of kind of look forward. And I mean, the first part is that learning how to prepare these nanostructures that are functional and well-defined is exciting. We haven't had access to these kinds of materials before. And having access to those will spur and motivate lots of scientific questions to understand what properties they have, what you can build. Uh, we are excited specifically about scaffolds for rewiring cellular activities. And what I mean by this is you saw in that video that cells have these different proteins that are spatially organized. And a lot of function in the cell doesn't happen because a protein turns on or turns off. It happens because two proteins are brought together and find each other, and then they can interact. With these scaffolds, we can create sites that bring different proteins together. So we can create links, functional links, between different activities in the cell. So if you stimulate the cell to grow, we might rewire it by putting a new node in it that makes it differentiate instead. And so this is what I mean about a blueprint that would let us start to be more predictive and use the principles and the rules of biology to intervene and override that biology. And then this kind of last point, new materials properties. The thing that's exciting about nano is that you can take an old material like silver, and if you control its shape and its size, you can give it new properties. You know, it's not silver, it's red or it's green. You can change its catalytic properties. So we can take old materials, but actually invent new properties by controlling the size. And you can only do that once you have the methods to synthesize with control that structure. And so with these materials, because they're made up of all these different pieces we tie together, we can bring multiple functions in and start to make multifunctional materials and what I would call programmable matter, this idea that the same building blocks can be reorganized to give different properties. So just like a, a Lego set, you can take the pieces, take them apart, and build a different structure. These proteins might give us that ability. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, uh, I'm going to, I think we're going to have a little discussion section. Mark and I have time. I don't know what the weather is outside and if it's snowing or not. But thanks for everybody for coming out, for supporting C2ST. How well are we able to selectively add the linker protein? So, could you, could you uh, keep all of the like, end to end ones away and just add the, um, the three pronged ones? Or do you have to sort of have them all at least one? We tend to do this uh, stepwise. So, we start with one structure, add the linkers, add the next proteins instead of doing it in one pot. As we get to more, and the reason is that there are multiple reactions that could happen and we might get polymerizations. As we get to more building blocks so that every linkage between a building block is unique, then we should be able to take all the pieces, put them together, and it assembles. And this is kind of the idea of self-assembly. You know, if you're building a picnic table, it'd be nice if you just threw all the pieces in your swimming pool and they knew how to come together and give you a picnic table. That's how biology builds structures. It's not by grabbing one, sticking it to another, but it's by having these all floating around and they know how to find each other and pair up and give the, the final structure. Yeah, so that's a good question. Have we gotten any functions? We've, we've uh, conjugated gold nanoparticles to those structures and we can control what the aggregate looks like, how many nanoparticles are brought together, whether we have a small one here and a big one here, and what the distance is between them. And it's interesting because just as the size of the nanoparticle can affect its reflectivity, its color, 
two particles that are close to one another couple electromagnetically and you get a shift in their color. And by creating aggregates that are defined, you get unique spectral properties of each. So the idea is these might be interesting tags. They're nanoparticles. If we dope them into currency, for example, you couldn't see them if you're looking at it with your eye. But if you looked with the right spectroscopy, you could determine which aggregate was there. So these are counterfeit uh, uh, proof kinds of tags in the same way that Professor Ratner talked about the pharmaceutical protection. So that sort of thing works well, building defined aggregates of nanoparticles. So with proteins and their stability, uh, it, the, proteins can be engineered to be more stable so that they can operate at, in 80 degree water. So your laundry detergent has proteins in it, uh, esterases and proteases that help dissolve stains. And those are stable up to 90 degrees. Uh, so some are not stable, some are. Proteins have been engineered to be stable in organic solvents and in air form. So uh, most aren't stable, but the exciting thing is that protein evolution and a number of other techniques can take a protein that's not stable and find analogs of it that have the same function but are stable. So the prospect is kind of reasonable that you could plug these into different kinds of applications. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, so typically a reaction would be 20 minutes or so per step. And normally reactions would be slow because these proteins are big, their concentrations in solution are low, and so the rate constants for their reactions are low. But what happens here is there's an initial binding of the ligand to the protein, which brings them together, and then there's the reaction that couples them. And so we, that's where this uh, dock and lock idea comes from. So in practice, 20 minutes per step. The uh, cell you showed is alive. And the nanotransistor is not a living thing. Are you driving toward an idea of creating a living kind of electronic structure? Nanotransistor is built by self-assembly techniques, but the idea is that it's very much like what Milan showed on this first slide, which are built by lithographic techniques. Basically, that's top-down, right? You start with a slab of silicon, and you bring in some device, some tool that will carve it into a chip, and that's the way Silicon Valley works, right? And that's the way Intel makes its chips. What, what Milan is suggesting is from the bottom up, you could do it biologically, but you could also do it in other ways. So, for example, my example of the, of the um, puddle of gasoline on top of the bubble of water, it's organized by its chemical processes. You know, the, the oil doesn't like water. It likes to bind to other oil molecules, so it does that. The idea of a living computer, your living computer, um, I don't think that, I don't think the logic structures are necessarily associated with the life structures, right? So you can extract entities from living animals and, and they will function without being alive. I, I'm not quite answering your question, I think. You want to know about whether you could build a living computer? Is that, is that the general question? So, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So we, I don't yet know how to think about taking these ideas and creating uh, 
biological computers that are living but aren't an organism. So recreating a living system for a computational purpose. Uh, so I think we're, you know, still a long way away from realizing that that might be a possibility. Uh, and if it were a possibility, there are serious ethical questions and others that uh, need to be thought through by a broader audience. What I do think is possible is that the design rules that can be appreciated from a biological system. So if you have, you know, it's interesting, if you take a worm, it has a few thousand neurons. That's a really small number, a few thousand parts. And in a worm, we, we know what each neuron is connected to. So we know which one is connected, and they're all named. So if you look at the nematode anatomy, this is all defined. But we don't know how a worm works. Uh, we don't know how it can move, what gates it uses to sequence its neuron excitations and muscle pulls. But that seems to me to be a system where you can model it. 3,000 neurons, you know the architecture. If you understood the relationships between how every unit interacts with its partners, we should be able to come up with the design rules of how a, ner a, a worm works. So when I kind of think about design rules, I think our first challenge, you know, the first 10 years is taking simple biological systems relatively and seeing if we can actually work out the blueprint that explains how it works. And if it does, I think that insight may lead to building transistor-based devices where the transistors don't talk to another in a digital fashion but more in an analog fashion, which is a hallmark of biological computers, and where you get nonlinearities and other things that give interesting function. So I think that's kind of the first stage uh, where we're not working in the living system, but we're taking the design rules from the living system and implementing them in an inorganic system. Depends on what they are. I mean, what Milan just showed, these, these biological entities that are held together by these links, those were optical techniques. You just put them down on a surface. If you get down to the really, really small, right now the node size in, in computers is tending towards about 24 nanometers as the gate length. It's really pretty small. You can still see them, and you see them with scanning probe techniques, but you can also see them with x-ray techniques and other light scattering techniques. But as you get really, really, really small, you know, the size of atoms and molecules, it's going to be hard to figure out how big they are. There are a few techniques that will work sometimes, but mostly they work when you make a crystal, right? It's not just one water molecule, it's a whole crystal of water molecules. And then because of the similarities, you can actually see how big a water molecule is. And people figured that out in the 1930s. Estimating sizes for single entities that are really small, I think is still a quite difficult problem. It scales exponentially. So as you create more building blocks, more of these units that can selectively find their partners and, and snap together, uh, if you get up to eight or nine of those building blocks, uh, which gives you roughly squared over half fusion proteins, you can start to get to quite complex structures over length scales of a few hundred nanometers that are precisely defined. And in terms of you know, building a computer chip, uh, it seems plausible to me that in 10 years, one might. I mean, this isn't a guarantee, but it's not in, uh, unfeasible that one might have a set of building blocks and reactions that could be used to create a uh, half micron by half micron grid of any structure. And then these can further be tailored so that once that template is in place, those protein building blocks may include protein domains that weren't involved in the assembly, they're in between the ends, but are then involved in being able to capture something else, like precursors to wires, so that one could start to build circuits that look more like our circuits, but at a length scale that's not uh, uh, achievable with photolithographic processing. So we'll see. I think the bigger kind of attraction is that you can process materials that are incompatible with photolithography. 
and uh, biological structures tend to be incompatible with photolithography, the organic solvents, the light, et cetera. And this gives an orthogonal set of, of, of conditions and, and uh, assembly methods that could access those. So the way I think about it is these structures don't normally uh, replace existing semiconductor technology, but they take it in a direction where semiconductor technology hasn't been useful. One other remark on that. I mean, transistors are the fundamental entities of computers. As far as I know, there are no biological transistors. Many biological entities by from there. They do wonderful things. But biology didn't seem to need to have a transistor. Biology does memory in a very different way. So applying that point of view, even though I know you're too careful to give crystal ball guesses, <coughs> when do you think we'll be able to create a living cell in a laboratory from scratch? And I don't mean what Ventner has done, which credit to what he's done, but it's far, far removed from scratch. I mean, it's it's a great question, and to just amplify a little bit more on Craig Ventner's work, I mean, he took an organism, took the DNA out, put in synthetic DNA, and it was a replacement, then the organism kept going. What's never been, so that's not creating life, if you use those terms, it's uh, taking life, taking out a piece, putting the piece back in, and regenerating life, but creating a living system from pieces that themselves aren't living is a much harder problem. Can we do it? When will we be able to do it? It's a really good question. There's a field of chemistry that's uh, referred to as origin of life. Uh, you take uh, simple compounds that are found in space, you put them under conditions of arcs and electricity and light, and you ask whether on a clay surface they can come together and produce an amino acid or other early building blocks. And thinking through from a molecular evolution perspective, if you uh, do, uh, how you can kind of sequence individual events to give a system which is living. I don't think anybody really understands how to connect all those dots or whatever those, what you, even what those dots are. So to answer your question, when can we create a system that's living? I think the first ones will be chemical systems where there are molecules that come together, create a molecule that can then catalyze the replication of itself that is energy dependent. So living systems have the characteristic that they're not at equilibrium. They're far from equilibrium. They have an energy flux running through them and that's needed to keep them out of equilibrium. I think one can define those kinds of characteristics of what makes a system living versus non-living and uh, strive for chemical examples that exhibit that. Evolvability is one necessary feature, I think, of a living system. It's got to be able to adapt to a selective pressure. And if a system doesn't have a way to adapt, it's not in those terms a living system. So I think we're a long ways off still, but I can kind of see a path at a chemical level of replicating those features in a flask. I was hoping you'd say it would be in my lifetime. <laughs> I want to look forward to very 
you look like you're in really good shape, but just let me make one taxpayer's remark. I was on a committee a few years ago at the, at the Department of Energy, and exactly this question came up because we were looking for some big questions to ask, really big questions. And the biggest question that we could come up with was to create a cell, to create a cell not using another cell, but using something what Milan has done. You know, start with very small entities, glue them together in a particular way, and make a cell. And it was determined that over the time scale we were talking about, which was six years, that was out of the question. Now, that was a few years back. I think probably six years is still a little short. But yeah, in your lifetime it's going to happen, I think. One more question. Yeah, so, so in non-biological systems, in non-biological systems, small things can do great things. So that's the nano idea, right? You make things at a very small level over which you have very good control, very good control. And then you use the properties of atoms and molecules to create entities. For example, artificial sunscreens. For example, um, computers. That's exactly what we do. We put together pieces of metal and silicon and gallium arsenide and various other materials. We fabricate them in a particular way at a very, very small scale, and they behave wonderfully. Right? Now, there are some things we can't do. We still can't build very good batteries, actually. It'd be nice if we could. But that kind of fabrication is quite different from the way biology is normally done. It's the top-down versus bottom-up stuff that I was talking about before. Tend, you know, when we were in high school, we were in shop, right? And you cut the piece of wood to be as big as you wanted. And if you wanted to make a, a, a drawer, you made a drawer. And if you wanted to make, I don't know, a wood block, you made a wooden block or a circle. By cutting away, biology tends to build up. And we're trying to learn, both in biological and non-biological systems, to put things together from the bottom up. But it's difficult. That's right, and another kind of the pressures on the size, if these particles get too big, they don't diffuse anymore. And so the times required for these to reorganize, to rearrange, to find each other go down because the diffusion coefficients go down. If the particles get too small, they don't have enough functionality. So proteins are interesting because they've got a lot of surface area. They've got different pockets that can catalyze reactions, different surfaces that can interact with other proteins, if they get smaller, you'll lose that functionality. So this size range of 10 to 50 or meters uh, seems to me to kind of be the balance of having enough functionality that the building blocks are useful, they're interesting, but not get big enough where things just take too long to happen because they don't diffuse around fast enough. That would be my kind of first order We'll take one more because you had your hand up. Robert was asking about quantization, which is when the rules change. All the rules that Isaac Newton told us, you know, you've done something and the harder you push, the faster it goes. Um, you can chop energy up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. That doesn't rule any longer at the very small scales, and they're quantum effects. 
not all that complicated. Most of the colors that you see in this room are because of quantum effects. We live with these all the time. It's just that they're a little bit unusual. Um, the question about whether you need to use the quantum rules to design the kinds of things that, make, that Milan is making, that's a very interesting question because, of course, it is quantum mechanics that's making it happen. But on a functional basis, it's organic chemistry, right? I mean, you're basically putting entities together that bind in the way that molecules bind to one another. So at the bottom of it is quantum mechanics for sure. But whether or not any of the weird quantum weirdness that Mr. Einstein didn't like is important or not, it's an interesting question. And just one last remark, and then we will stop. I showed that piece of, of that cartoon of photosynthesis, and I said there were four nanostructures in that cell. The way the energy is actually moved or trans transcribed, transpired, transfixed, trans from one place to another, depending on the entity, that may or may not be a mechanical effect. And so there's a big dispute at the moment about whether or not it remembers where it was which would make it quantum mechanical, or if it just does things the way this bottle does. When I, when I lift it, it falls. There's nothing quantum mechanical about that. So there is some whole field, actually, of bi biology called quantum biology where people worry about these effects. I think it's, it's still not a major area, but it's of interest. Well, it's 7.30 past, so Professor Ratner and Berkshitz, thank you so much for the presentation. And thank you all for coming. Um, please fill out the evaluation card and on the way out, hand over to one of our staff members. Thanks again.